Welcome to Redacted Tonight VIP, I'm Lee Camp. Today's episode is an all-star team of awesome. I have journalist Aaron Mate here. You might know him from his work with Democracy Now!, The Real News, The Nation Magazine, and The Gray Zone Project. He's been the go-to analyst recently, exposing Russiagate for the empty conspiracy theory it is. In the second half of the show, we will go over the new developments with the Mueller report that have made the mainstream media look like they're wearing their underwear on the outside of their pants. But first, I talk with one of my favorite guests, economics professor Richard Wolf. He'll help me understand what the hell is going on with Trump's tariff mania, as well as why most of the Democratic candidates for president sound like they don't understand capitalism at all. Here now is my conversation with Professor Richard Wolf. Professor Wolf, it's a pleasure to have you back. Well, Lee, I'm very glad to be back and working a bit with you. Absolutely. So, so Trump has been pushing these, these trade wars. It seems there's one every day that he's ranting about. The biggest one is with tr China, but also there's, there's been uh, tiffs with Mexico and, and even threats towards Canada. When he, he, you know, he then seems to inevitably back down at the last moment and run away claiming victory. And while I think Trump's ego plays a big role in all of these decisions and what's going on, I don't think that's all it is. So I was hoping you could uh, explain what's going on here. Well, I think beyond his ego, and I agree with you, there's more going on. There's also uh, his election strategy, he, his, his attempt to portray himself as the champion who's righting the wrongs of the previous administration, Mr. Obama, and by extension, everybody who's come before him. He's the greatest. He's the best. He's getting better deals for us we Americans who have been shortchanged, this whole fantastical story uh, has to be maintained and repeated all the time, partly because it is made up. It, 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 there's nothing to it. And so he has to reenact it, mm -hmm. whether it's with China or Europe or Canada. Uh, so it's partly also his reelection strategy to, to keep that image of himself alive. But let's get to the even more important part. Mm -hmm. The reality is, that the, the core, the center of the capitalist system in the world has moved. It was born in England, it extended itself to Western Europe, then America, then Japan. But in the last 30, 40 years, it has moved again. It was inevitable that it would, and the time has come. They can make more money, these businesses, uh, paying workers less in China or India or Brazil, than they would have to pay in the United States. Getting out of ecological or environmental limits on what they're allowed to do, right. uh, they can do that easier there. So they're gone. They have kissed the West goodbye. And they're making their deals now with the Chinese and the Indians and the Brazilians. And the United States is facing the fact that in its competition with other countries, its own economic corporations are leading the shift over there and away from here. Mm -hmm. And that is really having a, a shaking effect on the United States. It makes China the real up and coming power in the world, the major competitor, the, comp the country that's already out competing us in a number of things, not just 5G technology as in Huawei Corporation, but the General Motors Company uh, has a bigger market in China for its cars now than it does here. Yeah. And I think you're seeing the anxiety of the whole governing elite in the United States that something is slipping away from them and they're looking at Mr. Trump Yes, he's a bit of a clown. Yes, he's not quite serious. But they would love to imagine that he can somehow stop or reverse what history is doing to the United States. I don't think there's a chance in the world, but it's a lovely dream and that it keeps them from turning against Mr. Trump, uh, at least until the trade war bites into their profits. And, and speaking of these trade deals, I, I wanted to ask you about a, a contradiction that I've been thinking about. Trade deals in general, like TPP and NAFTA, they're basically meant to allow corporations to avoid the risk of democracy. I think that was the expression Noam Chomsky used. They're written by corporate lobbyists and lawyers. The average American have basically no say in these trade deals. And 
it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what people vote for if the trade deal has already given away their rights. But when Trump pulls out of these trade agreements and nails Mexico or China with tariffs, that also is bad for average American workers. So should we want trade deals and business as usual before Trump came in there, or do we hate trade deals? I think you've answered your own question, Lee. Here's the reality. It doesn't matter. In other words, you're right. Whether we have TPP or we have what Trump calls bilateral deals between the United States and each of these companies or countries, it'll be the same lobbyists from the same companies, excluding the same mass of working people from whatever deals get written. We shouldn't get drawn into a debate in which we lose either way. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like the British working class about Brexit. If they stay in Europe, if they leave Europe, the same conservative party is ruling England and will continue to rule it either way in, for the benefit of the few and at the costs for the many. We right. ought to be fighting a battle that really helps us rather than getting drawn in to what you correctly see as a losing proposition either way. Right, that's a, that's a great point, yeah. And with Brexit, whether they're part of the European Union or not, if it's the same corporate oligarchs that are, that are running things, it, it doesn't change that much. Uh, I wanted to move on to uh, Trump has also been going after the Federal Reserve recently. That's his latest uh, arch nemesis, or it seems. He, he wants them to lower interest rates. Why is he so caught up with that? That's a pure election operation. Here's the situation. Capitalism as an economic system, in every country where it exists, has an economic downturn. Uh, sometimes it's called a recession or a depression or a crisis. Every four to seven years, that's the average, in every country, including our own. Well, the last downturn was in 2008, 2009. So if you use the four to seven year average, we're due for one. We're kind of overdue for one. And so everyone knows it's coming. And they've told Mr. Trump what I just said. And Mr. Trump figured out that if there's a, a recession, especially if because it's lasted so long, this upturn, the recession coming will be equally bad going down, he can kiss his reelection goodbye. So he has to come up with some strategy to postpone the downturn until after the election so it doesn't destroy his chances. How do you do that? You try to give an artificial boost. How do you do that? You lower interest rates. You make it cheaper for people to buy a car, at least in the short run, to buy a home with a mortgage, at least in the short run, uh, to invest a little bit, mm -hmm. if maybe they'll do it, to rack up a bit more on their credit card. So you lower interest rates, it's an attempt to push off, to postpone the downturn so it doesn't destroy his election. What it does to the broader economy, he could care less. How it affects our trading partners, he could care less. And by the way, they're not missing that. They are understanding that American politics will permit the American government now to act out of concert with our allies, so to speak, in a way that makes every one of them looking around for better deals with other people, mm -hmm. like the Chinese, like the Russians, and like all those others who you before kept away, but now that the United States, in their view, has gone rogue, they're looking into that. So it's a very dangerous but purely self-serving move by Mr. Trump. Yeah, it really is all about the, the next election for him and the popularity. I assume you saw yeah. that uh, last week Facebook announced it was coming out with its own cryptocurrency called Libra. Now, no matter whether someone loves Bitcoin or hates B Bitcoin, it, it seems odd that we should trust Facebook to run a currency. Your thoughts on that? It's absolutely odd. It's actually scandalous. And the way you can best see it is with the history of how money has been managed here in the United States, and it's very similar in other countries. Once upon a time, early in the United States, the first several decades, we allowed as a nation private profit-seeking companies, mostly banks, 
to produce their own money. That they could write pieces of paper which were IOUs of the bank and which were allowed to, surf, uh, to circulate as legal tender, the way our money does now. That got to be so chaotic, that got to be so corrupt, because every bank would use its ability to basically print money to solve its own immediate technical and profit problems, no matter what the consequences were. Mm -hmm. So we took, as a nation, we took away the right for each bank, for private enterprises to produce money. We gave the printing of money to the government as its exclusive monopoly and created the Federal Reserve eventually to monitor all of that and control it precisely because it's unsafe to let something as important as money be in the hands of private profit-seeking enterprises. Mm. So what Facebook is doing is going backwards in history to what we already know is too dangerous to allow and presenting us with the risk of going back and repeating again the disasters that led to preventing this in the first place. Yeah, sounds like a real horror show and that's not even getting into the pri mm. privacy concerns of it. Um, yeah, right. In the in the uh, Democratic debates, there there hasn't been that much talk about capitalism, but a little bit capitalism and, and socialism. Um, there was one moment where uh, Senator uh, Gillibrand uh, gave made a brand made, made a grand statement about the real problem with capitalism is that the greed is at the top of these corporations, and it's these greedy people who put. Profit before people, and we just need to extract that greed, and then all will be well with the American system. And it was a big applause line. Your response? Uh, she lives in another planet from me, <laughs> and I like her. It's not, nothing, nothing about her. It's just a bizarre effort to not deal with that scary word, socialism or to deal with the scary idea that we could do better than capitalism and ought to be talking about it. The, the easy way to respond to her is this. If it's the greedy people at the top that are making all the bad decisions, then you have to ask the question, why does this system find, reward, and promote those very greedy people so they're in a position to do all that damage. Right. And the answer is capitalism is a system that rewards greed, that promotes greed, that celebrates greed, that says that the corporation that's successful is because the CEO had the muscle and the smarts and the long story short, the greed to grab opportunities to outwit the competitors and all the rest. If you don't want to have greedy people in a bad social position to do damage, then you have to change a system that systematically for 200 to 300 years has brought these nasty greedy people to the positions where they do the very damage that G Kristen Gillibrand is able to point to. Yeah, I find it's uh, useful to think of it as gravity. Capitalism has a gravity to pull those people to, right. to the top of these organizations, these, uh, these corporations. In our last minute here, I wanted to ask you about one other moment in the debate where they talked about automation, and I can't remember which candidate it was, but uh, they said the answer to unemployment caused by automation is to make sure that automated jobs are replaced with an equal number of high-tech jobs. But I was under the, under the understanding that the whole point of automation, or not the whole point, but a lot of it, was supposed to be that we humans don't have to work as hard. What happened to that idea? Well, you have sold every automation, every wave of automation, whether it was the steam engine or the railroad or electricity or atomic energy or now high-tech computer uh, artificial intelligence, you've always sold it on the grounds that it would free up our time, make us work less hard. And the reality is people are working harder today than they ever did, longer hours than they ever used to, and on and on and on. And the only times that we ever cut the work week or the work day has been when masses of working people have gone out onto the streets and made that happen. Here's the fundamental issue. When a new machine comes along, that allows workers to do twice as much work as they used to in the same amount of time, how does the capitalist system handle it? 
The answer is we fire half the workers. Mm -hmm. We tell them, get lost. We don't need you. The other half, with these new machines, can do what you used to do. And the corporation does that because they can produce just as much as before with half the workers. They don't have to pay the half that they fired, and they can keep all that money that they used to have to pay in wages to that half of the working uh, population and keep it for themselves. More profits for them, great to have technology. But of course there's an option. You could have decided that, oh, if workers are twice as productive with the new machine, everybody will work half as many hours per week as they did before, and that will produce just as many goods to be sold, just as much revenue for the company, but the benefit of the technology will have been in a, ra a rapidly changing life for people as they explore and enjoy the leisure the work has made possible. We don't do that, not because that isn't an equal or better way to use technology, but because that's not a profit profitable way to pay workers the same for half the time to use technology in that way is great for the workers but doesn't produce profit for the capitalists and therefore we go the way capitalists want because they run this system at least as long as the majority lets them. And we wouldn't make that choice if we had Democracy at Work, which is your website that you founded, an organization you founded. Thank you so much, Professor Wolf, for, for coming back on. Great to be here, Lee, and great to talk about these things. It's the kind of conversation that we ought to have in our country uh, and don't have often enough. We have to go to a quick break, but I'm performing live in London, England, as well as Kansas City, Minneapolis, and more. Tickets and details are at redactedtour.com. You can also vote for your city to be added to the tour. I'll be right back with Aaron Mate. Welcome back to Redacted Tonight VIP. I'm still Lee Camp. You know him from Democracy Now!, The Nation Magazine, The Real News Network, and The Gray Zone Project. Here's my interview with investigative journalist Aaron Mate. Aaron, great to finally have you on. Lee, thanks for having me. You've been doing amazing work, especially over the past year on the insanity of Russiagate. And we hardly go a week without new stuff coming out showing just how lame this neo-McCarthyist witch hunt has been. I want to start with Konstantin Kalimnik, the Ukrainian businessman connected to Paul Manafort. Uh, he's one of the main players in the Mueller report. Describe who he is and what we found out recently about him. To begin with, with Manafort, there's a whole bunch of misconceptions, starting with there's this false belief that Manafort, when he was working in Ukraine, was doing the Kremlin's bidding. And because of that narrative, uh, the implication is that somehow uh, Manafort brought that, that pro-Kremlin agenda to the Trump campaign. The reality is that uh, when Manafort was there, he was doing the exact opposite. He was trying to push his Ukrainian client away from Russia and to align with the West. But that's just one example of the inconvenient facts that have been ignored to push a uh, you know, narrative of a Trump-Russia conspiracy, now at this point, I think pretty much completely discredited. Uh, and Manafort's association with his, uh, his business associate, Konstantin Kalimnik, is another example of that. Uh, we've been told throughout this affair that Kalimnik has ties to Russian intelligence, although Mueller, who made that contention, never specified what he meant by that, so it's rather ambiguous. Like, what, does, what do ties mean? Did right. he talk to someone? Who's in Russian intelligence? Is he formally working with them? Mueller never explains. And I think we know now why he never tried to specify what he's talking about, because we've recently learned uh, more detail about Kalimnik's ties to the U.S., where Kalimnik, in fact, had uh, a, a, a deep relationship with the State Department, so much so that he was a, uh, seen as a valued informant, uh, passing on information to the State, Depor to, to the State Department at the same time that Manafort was in Ukraine. So again, it's just one more inconvenient fact that gets ignored in the rush to, put, to uh, push a conspiracy theory. And that's really what Russiagate is based on to begin with, a conspiracy theory that somehow yeah. for over two years became the dominant issue of US media and political culture. Yeah, and the irony of, you know, oh, they were talking with this Russian asset, and it turns out he's a State Department asset is so 
I mean, it's so incredible. I, I want to back up a little, and uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to give some of the talking points that I'm hit with, or anybody who who discusses this hit with, by people who just get their information from MSNBC or CNN or NPR. They've come down with Mad Al disease, and and. I'm going to just say these talking points, and I just want to hear your, your response, your reaction. So, so here we go. Russia hacked our election. We know that. That's a given now. Go ahead. OK, well, first of all, uh, the allegation might be true. I mean, it's possible. I don't think we've heard sufficient evidence yet. Uh, part of the problem is we have a culture in this country where whenever intelligence officials say something, we're supposed to just believe them on faith. But you know, as a journalist especially, uh, I try to assess claims based on the available evidence. And the available evidence for this claim of a, a Russia hacking the election, I don't think has been established yet. If you look at Mueller's report, there's a lot of uh, flaws with his narrative. Um, and second of all, I mean, there's another reason, I think, to be skeptical of these claims, which is that our intelligence community has a history of being wrong. I mean, we all know what happened with the Iraq war, where mm -hmm. uh, our supposed intelligence services had convincing proof that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction and may have been working with Al Qaeda. Among the intelligence officials who pushed that narrative was none other than Robert Mueller, as then director of the FBI. So there's just a reason, no matter what the claim is, to be skeptical and to demand evidence. And I just don't think that we've seen that in the case of Russiagate. Um, now, let's say Russia did steal Democratic Party emails. Okay, uh, you know, it's not good to steal things and to steal things over the internet and to influence, to try to influence other countries' politics. Whatever Russia may have done, if they actually did it, uh, is minuscule in compared to what we normalize doing around the world every single day. So, you know, for all this claim about Russia hacking our democracy, well, the same people making this charge in Congress and on MSNBC have no problem with the Trump administration right now trying to overthrow uh, the government in Venezuela mm -hmm. with a military coup and sanctions that are killing tens of thousands of people. So whatever the merits of the case against Russia are, I think we need to put this in perspective. And if we're going to be upset about alleged foreign interference, if we're not going to be hypocrites, we should look at what we're doing on a far harsher and more violent scale around the world. Yeah, yeah, very, very true. And. It seems that the, I mean, even the phrasing of Russia hacked the election is meant to kind of uh, confuse people because the, the reality of the claim is that they hacked the DNC server. And then those, it seems like there was no real investigation into whether that actually happened. The DNC servers, according to Donna Brazil, were destroyed. Uh, and then the FBI never saw the real servers. And then we just found out, was it last week or two weeks ago, from uh, Roger Stone's court documents that the FBI never even saw an unredacted report from CrowdStrike, the private company that supposedly looked into the hacking. Yes, so this is where it gets confusing. And the problem is there's just a lot of information we don't know for sure yet. That's why, again, it all might be true what the US intelligence community says. But my fundamental point is that we just haven't seen sufficient evidence yet. And the point you raise raises questions about what we know. Uh, the FBI did rely on CrowdStrike, a private firm, uh, which itself has ties to the FBI. One of its former executives worked for Robert Mueller. Its uh, founder is a, a Russian national who is openly hostile to Putin. Uh, CrowdStrike's previous claims about a supposed Russian hacking effort in Ukraine had to be retracted. And that's relevant especially because some of the same claims that made about, uh, you, about Russia in the Ukraine case were also made about Russia in this case. Uh, and yeah, we found out, and probably from Roger Stone, uh, from his attorneys, that when the US government uh, received uh, reports from CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike itself redacted those reports. And the US government basically took CrowdStrike's word that none of those redactions contained evidence uh, uh, about Russian hacking. So it's suspect, to say the least, that for the key issue of forensics on the server that was supposedly hacked, the US government is relying on a private contractor. And it, this puts yet another D, a Democratic Party contractor, at the heart of Russiagate. Because, so here we have CrowdStrike at the mm -hmm. heart of the Russian hacking allegation. And then when it comes to the now discredited collusion allegation, well, where does that come from? Well, 
uh, none other than Fusion GPS, which was working for the Hillary Clinton campaign and through this former British agent, Christopher Steele put out this kooky dossier right. alleging you know, a high level of Trump-Russia conspiracy and blackmail. So yeah, that's just one of many questions uh, that leave us without convincing answers. What about the fact that Mueller indicted Russians for hacking the election? Well, that's an indictment, and he does lay out a very uh, detailed narrative, uh, and on the surface, it does look pretty convincing. My problem with that, with that indictment is we don't know the intelligence that it's based on. Uh, we don't know who it comes from, if it comes from the FBI, if it comes from the NSA. The NSA would be the best uh, place U.S. intelligence source to tell us exactly what happened, because it has eyes everywhere. Uh, but if that's the case, then there's some language in the Mueller indictment and the report that is kind of fuzzy and suggests it didn't come from the NSA. Because Mueller uses language like in or around a certain date. He doesn't give us a specific timestamp, whereas the NSA would know precisely when a, you know, uh, a log on or a hacking operation would occur. And if you read Mueller's report carefully, there's a very uh, key passage where he's talking about the incident where he says the GRU is, 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 has hacked into the DNC server, and he's describing the moment where he says that the emails were stolen. Well, he says, during these sessions, and I'm paraphrasing, the GRU officers, quote, appear to have stolen thousands of emails. Well, if Mueller knew for sure that the GRU during these sessions stole the emails, why is he using the word appear? So that kind of qualified tentative language, which is elsewhere, elsewhere throughout his report as well, says to me that Mueller is not as convinced about his claims as we think he is. Yeah, and then uh, I've heard some of the other ways that they believe it was Russians was that they saw, you know, Russian alphabet in the code or something, and, and the, the hours they were working were Russian hours. These are all, I mean, these, these seem like laughable things that anyone who knows how the CIA or any, really any state uh, uh, intelligence agency could drop that stuff in there to mislead people. Um, but I also wanted to get to, uh, to you note in your, your article for The Nation, uh, your recent one, the, the Mueller report details Trump's campaign's connection to Russia-connected people, and those details seem to actually undermine the case that there was a conspiracy, right? One striking illustration of this is that there's a line in Mueller's report that did not get very much attention where he's talking about the period after the campaign. And Mueller says, he's, ta he's, he's talking about high-level Russian government officials and top uh, Russian entrepreneurs, elites. And he says that all these people in Russia, in the government and in the you know, upper echelons of society, they struggled to make contacts with the incoming Trump administration because they appeared not to know how to, how, to, how, to, how to reach them, and they appeared not to have pre-existing contacts. Well, that's puzzling. How is it that if, you, if these people supposedly conspired before the election, all of a sudden after the election, uh, the high-level Russians don't know even know who to contact? But yet, that's just one detail that gets overlooked, and instead what gets highlighted is all of these inconsequential contacts between anybody in the Trump orbit and anybody who either has a Russian passport or who claims to know somebody with a Russian passport. <laughs> but if you go through every single one of them, and it's easy to kind of get overwhelmed because there's such extensive detail, nothing of consequence happens that could lead us anywhere to a conspiracy. And in fact, it repeatedly undermines the case uh, for a conspiracy. You know, one uh, illustration of that fact is that if you look at who the Trump campaign and its associates interacted with, who are with, in terms of who they interacted with supposedly on behalf of Russia, Mueller never says that anybody acted on behalf of the Kremlin except for two people, the Russian ambassador, which, you know, which happens basically with pretty much every single country during a campaign. Ambassadors will speak to uh, campaign officials, as happened here. And then an assistant in the Kremlin office, who, in the Kremlin spokesperson's office, who called back Michael Cohen, uh, who was then President Trump's, or the candidate Trump's personal attorney, uh, when Cohen was trying to get help to, to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. And this assistant told Cohen in a 20 minute phone call, sorry, we can't help you, but if you want to come to, a, uh, to an economic forum in St. Petersburg like four months from now, you're welcome to come. So that's the extent of Trump orbit contacts with people actually acting on behalf of Russia. It's the Russian ambassador and someone saying, Sorry, we can't help you. 
How about the, uh, the point that Mueller indicted Russians for manipulating Americans, destroying American minds with Facebook ads? You know, so much of Russiagate to me is a joke. I mean, the notion to begin with that Donald Trump, a reality TV show host, conspired with the Russian government, that the Russian government is also blackmailing Trump with a P-tape. I mean, it's pretty funny, and it's <laughs> on its surface, I just find the whole thing hilarious. But, you know, one outgrowth of that is this theory that Russian troll farm workers managed to, you know, sow chaos in American society with juvenile Facebook ads that nobody saw. So in the report, you can see the details for yourself. Mueller talks about how uh, there was about $100,000 spent by the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, a troll farm based in Russia, on Facebook ads. Uh, most of those ads were, uh, were, were paid for after the election. So it's difficult to see how those ads could have influenced the election if they hadn't even ran yet. Yeah, it, and most of the ads had nothing to do with the election. There are, you know, there's, there's Jesus memes and there's Buff Bernie memes. Right. And they have such a, a minuscule reach that the fact that we're even talking about them is, is, is just a joke. And it shows that, you know, the real th uh, threat of Russian disinformation here is not, you know, Russian social media disinformation itself. It's the uh, American disinformation about Russian disinformation to fear monger and to convince Americans that somehow Russian social media ads about Buff Bernie could possibly influence them. And in the process, it's like, how much contempt are the you know, US politicians and pundits who say this stuff, how much contempt are they showing for average Americans? This notion that Americans are so malleable that their votes could be changed by uh, barely visible ads that aren't even about the election. I mean, it, it's, it's just an expression of real contempt for average voters. And it, it speaks to how, why we have Russiagate to begin with. P enough people in enough states elected Donald Trump for whatever reason, I, I think he conned them into believing he was a working class champion and also anti-military intervention, neither of which were actually true. Mm -hmm. Enough people also really just didn't like the Clinton campaign and didn't like what they were offering. But instead of you know, reckoning with these realities and, and doing some self-reflection, the Democratic Party adopted this notion that it's a result of uh, Russian email hacking and juvenile such Russian social media, which is the real threat, I think, here from this election, the, the refusal by U.S. elites to look at their own country and to instead come up with fantasies to blame somebody else for their own problems. Yeah, I mean, this really seems to have been used as by the Democrats and our mainstream media to, to not look at why, why the Democrats can't beat one of the least popular candidates to uh, ever run for the office. Uh, I did think it was an important, speaking of average Americans, I thought it was an important moment in uh, the debate last week when the candidates, the 10 candidates on stage were asked, what's the greatest geopolitical threat? And all except one did not say Russia. Russia was not, and many of them were listing multiple things. It was only Bill de Blasio who said, ah, oh, it's the Russians are gonna get us. And, it, and I think it's because these candidates they, they're, they're out there, they're campaigning, they're in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and they realize that Americans at these crowds right now don't care about Russia. They're not talking about Russia. They're talking about medical care and student debt and feeding their families, right? Which is part of the reason why, you know, the small number of us on the left who were vocally pushing back against Russia Gate were so uh, adamant that it was, you know, not just a baseless conspiracy theory, but also a, a massive blunder from just a, a political point of view because you know uh, Americans don't care about this stuff. They want to hear about how politicians will improve their lives, not hear politicians blame a foreign government for their own failures, which is pretty much what the Democratic Party uh, did after losing to Donald J. Trump. And we saw that in the 2018 midterms. You know, after hyperventilating for you know so so long about. Uh, Russian, alleged Russian hacking and Russian social media posts and collusion, the 2018 midterms, Democrats pretty much dropped it and started talking about health care again. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they had some success. They won the House back. But it, it shows just how divorced, you know, U.S. politicians and especially corporate media outlets like MSNBC and the New York Times are div divorced and, in fact, contemptuous, are divorced from and, in fact, contemptuous, contemptuous of the concerns of, of everyday people. Yeah, and in this last minute here, has it, you know, because 
You, you know, you've worked with some great media organizations, but um, most of them, or maybe all of them, outside the, the, the kind of main corporate ones. Uh, has it surprised you to see your, your colleagues in the media go down this path for, for two years, uh, just taking pieces of nonsense to try and weave them together with, as, as the red dots? Yeah, well, one of the surreal aspects of the Russiagate era has been, unfortunately, you know, many progressive outlets and adversarial outlets, uh, many colleagues of mine, uh, go along with Russiagate, sort of drink the Kool-Aid. This was presented to us as sort of the dominant way to resist Donald Trump, that you know, uh, Donald Trump was guilty of conspiring with Russia and that Robert Mueller was going to validate it. And the Democratic Party and its elites and partisans in the corporate media did a very good job of spinning this and of enrolling people who are justifiably aggrieved by Trump's victory. Uh, and basically making this the dominant way to push back against Trump. And unfortunately, in the process, you know, many progressive and adversarial colleagues got caught up in that. And it's been surreal, the fact that people like myself and others who push back against it have been sort of relegated to the fringe, simply basically for not believing in Santa Claus, for, you know, <laughs> voicing skepticism about this notion that Donald Trump conspired with Russia and was being blackmailed by Russia, which is just laughable when you say it out loud. Uh, and also, you know, pushing back against all the attendant Russophobia, this fear-mongering about Russia, this fear-mongering that hacked emails and social media posts were an existential threat. And so it has been surreal to see that. I think that the Mueller report being such a dud, no conspiracy between Trump and Russia, mm -hmm. um, and then Mueller even punting on the obstruction issue, I think that's sort of taken the wind out of it, the uh, sails of Russiagate considerably, and I, I think now hopefully we'll all get back to covering the real issues that just got sidelined in this obsession with the conspiracy theory. Aaron Mate, thank you so much again, and I highly recommend everybody uh, keep up with your work at the Gray Zone Project and The Nation. Thanks again. Lee, thank you. That's all the time we have, but if you liked this, you would love my weekly podcast, Common Censored. It's free on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Or to hear about all of our videos via email, text the word redacted to 444-999. It's free and quick. Just shoot the word redacted to 444-999. Until next time, good night and keep fighting.